Good morning, Hope College. So if you're thinking what I'm thinking, we really ought to just dispense with listening to me and let the women's ensemble sing a few more numbers, right? Probably all agree with that. Yep. That was just beautiful. Well, you know, we've been going through a study of the book of Matthew, really sort of following Jesus along in the last days of his life leading up to Easter. And so during this season of Lent, as we think about the journey of Jesus toward the cross and ultimately toward resurrection, uh, we're taking time to really reflect on each step of the way, each experience that Jesus and his followers had during those crucial last days during Jesus' ministry on earth. And today we're looking at Matthew 27, the 27th through the 31st verse. Let me read this to you. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe, they put his own clothes on him, and they led him away to crucify him. Well, you will remember, I imagine, that in our recent readings, that this comes right after the trial of Jesus. You know, Jesus was taken before Pilate, and the governor um, is Pilate, when we hear about the governor's soldiers. And Pontius Pilate ultimately convicts Jesus and sentences him to be crucified because the clamoring crowd is demanding it and Pilate is afraid of a riot. And so here we have the soldiers, just prior to taking him away to crucifixion, having some fun with him, um, just taking some time to mock him and, and make fun of him a bit, and to inflict just a little bit more pain on him. Well, during this series that we've been studying, we've been using these art, the art exhibit that is now down in the Kreisinga Art Museum. These are images that you've seen a number of them by now that were created by the artist Otto Dix. And these are two images that depict Jesus wearing the crown of thorns. One of the things you'll notice about these images is that uh, Jesus and the people around him are depicted in clothing that looks a little bit more contemporary. And this is Dix trying to convey to us that this isn't just a story of the ancient past, but it's a story of today. And it's a story of our own part in crucifying Jesus. Um, the own suffering that we might inflict on Jesus ourselves. And so I think it's a very powerful image in that sense. I want to say just a bit about Otto Dix. Interesting artist, and you've maybe heard a bit about him up till now, but he was born in 1891. Um, he was actually conscripted into the German army in 1914 when World War I got underway. He was assigned to a machine gun unit that helped defend the line against the great British advance in the Battle of the Somme. And on the other side of the line, on the British side of the line, were two figures that most of you are familiar with, C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien. Um, and so we have the great artist, Otto Dix, on one side of the line, and these two authors who speak so eloquently in their own words about Jesus on the other side of the line. Very powerful thing to think about. Well, Dix was wounded a number of times. Ultimately, a near-fatal wound in the neck caused him to be discharged in September of 1918, but then years later, in his mid-50s, because the German army in World War II was short of soldiers, he was conscripted again and taken back into battle. And at that time, he was taken prisoner in France, and he was held prisoner in a prison where he was actually allowed to paint. They gave him the opportunity to do some of his artistic work during the time he was held. One of the images that he created at that time was this one. This is a portrait of a prisoner that he saw while he was being held captive. And you'll notice the barbed wire behind the prisoner's head. And Dix says that that barbed wire represents the crown of thorns. Um, it represents the kind of suffering that we experience that actually is so similar to what Jesus experienced. And the notion that Jesus can actually relate to the suffering of this prisoner because he himself uh, was inflicted with the same kind of suffering. So... I want to just share a few thoughts on what we make of Jesus' suffering during this very troubling um, and distressing passage of Scripture. You know, we just read the Roman soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns. They put it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand to symbolize the royal scepter, and they made fun of him. 
And the crown of thorns was painful. It was physically painful, especially when they struck it repeatedly with that staff. But maybe what was even more painful was the mockery, the being spat upon, uh, using these symbols of royalty to degrade him. And I think there's an irony here because unbeknownst to those soldiers, Jesus actually is a king. He's the king of the universe in human disguise. And it's this same Jesus who in the 19th chapter of Revelation, we read, will finally be acknowledged by all of creation as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. The writer of the letter to Hebrews says that Jesus was for a little while just a little lower than the angels, but was crowned with glory and honor because of his suffering so that he might taste death for everyone. And so, in fact, Jesus is a king. Those who are mocking him simply don't understand this. And this is the same Jesus that we meet in the opening words of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. That's never more true than this moment when Jesus is being mocked. The soldiers, the throngs of people calling for his crucifixion, even Jesus' own disciples in this moment really don't recognize who he is as the king and the creator of the universe. There's another meaning of the crown of thorns, though, and that is that it's a reminder that this is Jesus' fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah. It's a prophecy about the suffering servant. Here are just a few words from the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised. And we held him of no account. He was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole. And by his bruises, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to, led to slaughter, like a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. And you'll recall that before Pilate, Jesus declines to defend himself. When he's asked, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus simply replies and says, well, if you say so. And as he's before the soldiers during this time of, of uh, torture and humiliation, he's silent. He doesn't defend himself. He doesn't proclaim himself to be God. He doesn't call down that legion of angels uh, to intervene on his behalf. And so the prophecy actually is fulfilled in this moment as Jesus is silently and willingly withstanding the suffering that's inflicted on him. Then there's one more thing I just want to share about that crown of thorns. And it's this, that in the third chapter of Genesis, we read that thorns were actually a curse or a penalty for the sin of the first humans. God says, Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And so in taking on the crown of thorns, Jesus symbolically takes on the sin of the world and bears that curse for himself and on himself. By the way, I recently, uh, just a few weeks ago, reread a book by C.S. Lewis called The Problem of Pain. I recommend this book to any of you who are interested in thinking more deeply about the very troubling problem of pain. How is it that a good and loving God allows us to experience pain? How is it that God allowed his son to experience pain? C.S. Lewis, as many of you know if you've read his work, doesn't shrink from those tough questions. He takes them head on, and he does so in a way that's actually very understandable and very accessible to all of us. I found Lewis's sort of understanding of this challenge of, of coming to terms with the reality of pain in a world that is sustained by a loving God to be very helpful to me. So again, I just commend that to you. Lewis in that book says that he thinks that four-fifths of human suffering is actually inflicted by other humans. That would be separate from natural suffering, natural evil in the world, disease, natural disasters, and the other kinds of things that we experience. But I think he's probably right. Four-fifths of our suffering is actually that which is brought about by living in the company of other human beings. Certainly that's what Jesus is experiencing here in this incredibly personal way in the passage we just read. So I just want to conclude with a few practical lessons that I think are, are maybe worth reflecting on as we read this passage of Scripture in this leg of his journey toward the cross. First of all, I think it can be a comfort to us 
a comfort in our very worst hours when we're experiencing pain, to know that the creator and sustainer of the universe knows how it feels to be humiliated, mocked, rejected, denied, beaten, tortured, ultimately brutally murdered. As one who bore the sin of the world through his own suffering, it's the risen Christ, that is, the God who became flesh, who truly understands the pain that we experience and that we inflict on each other every day. We can give thanks that Jesus bore the sins of the world through his suffering and death and that his resurrection gives us confidence that he indeed came to give us abundant and eternal life. But we can also give thanks that we can pray to the one who has had firsthand experience with human pain and suffering. Second, I think we can learn from the, these last days of Jesus' life that Jesus set an example as one who prayed before and during the most painful ordeal of his life. He felt distant. He felt even forsaken by God, and yet he continued to cry out to God. He continued to persist in his prayer in the belief that God was there. Sometimes amidst suffering, we must even pray when we're not experiencing the relief or healing we desire, and sometimes even when we believe that God is not there. And ultimately, Jesus was a model for us in showing that it's okay even to express frustration with God when we believe that God is not there and not hearing us. And then finally, Jesus prayed for others, not just himself. He even prayed for those who tormented him. In the end, he asked God to forgive them. Even amidst our suffering, we might just use this as an example that during our own suffering, it can be helpful and even healing for us to pray for others, and especially to find it in our heart to pray for those who are mistreating us or inflicting pain on us. Jesus sets an example of this as well. And so as we leave this place today, I encourage you to have confidence that we worship a God of empathy, a God who has personally suffered the pain of this world and who actually did all that's necessary to assure us of a resurrection where there is no pain and suffering anymore. Go in peace. Thank you.